Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. We are going through the book of Genesis still, and for the next millennia, I imagine we will. Uh, in Genesis chapter 13, we're going to look at Lot. Lot is finally going to launch. Uh, I remember watching a movie some time ago called Failure to Launch. It was about a fully grown adult that stayed at home because his parents enabled him to do so, and he didn't want to commit, you know, the big... The big C word. None of you ever have that trouble, I'm sure. <laughs> but we're going to take a look at Lot, and it appears as though Abraham has been making it very comfortable for Lot because everywhere Abraham went, he was like the lamb that was sure to follow. We remember that he was told long before to leave your household, to leave your family, leave everybody and come to a land that I will show you. And so what he did was he went a little further north. He didn't even go west where the Lord told him to go. And he brought his father with him. His father ends up dying, and he buries him in Haran, which is a little bit more north. And then he eventually goes to Canaan, but he's dragging with him his nephew, who's Lot. Of course, he's very famous for being a citizen of Sodom which it doesn't work out so well for him, but we're approaching that. And in chapter 13, we're going to look at God superimposing his will upon human beings. You got trouble with that? It's funny, I, I realize that sometimes when I'm not obedient to do the things the Lord told me to do, he makes it my only choice. Have you ever had that experience? I've met lots of married couples who say when they met the person they married, they didn't like them. <laughs> I, I, how many of you were that way? You met your spouse and did not like them. Only one of you, thank you, Jane, I was thinking of you. Yes, didn't like them and you ended up marrying them. I, you know. I understand that. And then it's funny how the Lord brings you around so that you eventually do. Uh, and hopefully it's much more than liking. As we look at Abraham and Lot, as we're going through Genesis, just a reminder of where we've been. We were in Genesis chapter 11, and we were looking at the Tower of Babel and how it was man's plan to make a stairway to heaven and make his own way to God, and it represented human beings trying to make their own way to God, which we can't because we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He's the only stairway to heaven that God has created for us. And we were introduced in chapter 12 to Abraham, or Abram. I keep calling him Abraham because that's eventually what his name becomes. And Sarai, and uh, how they ended up getting together and moving out, and God's call on his life, and how he takes him out and moves him on. So last week... We looked at what happened. There was a bit of a mishap. God called him into the promised land, and he finally got around to getting there. And when he got there, there was a famine. <coughs> it's kind of like, you know, you pray and pray and pray for a job, and the Lord gives you a job, and you say, thank you, Lord, for this job. And then you go there, and it's a total nightmare. <laughs> or you pray and pray and pray and pray for a mate, and you get one, and it's a total nightmare. Single people pray to be married. Married people pray that they stayed single. It's natural. It happens. Hopefully you get over that. But here, they go down to Egypt. Egypt is always in the scriptures a picture of the world. And so Abraham takes all of his stuff. And you know, the longer you live, the more stuff you gather. He takes all of his stuff. I mean, the man's in his 90s now. He's taking his wife and his nephew, which really shouldn't be on the the trip, but he's taken Lot, and Lot has some of his own things. And he goes down, and as he goes down to Egypt, he tells Sarai, his wife, listen, when we get there, don't tell him you're my wife, because they, they don't have a problem with murdering me and picking you up, because you're, you're a hot woman. So don't do that. Tell him you're my sister. And so she does that. And Pharaoh's princes, the, the sons of Pharaoh, go and take a look at her and they go, hey, dad, she's really hot. You should add her to the rest that you have. 
And I don't know how that works out, but um, that's what they did. The princes talked her up to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh then took her, just took her. Just said, yeah, I'll have that. And in exchange for that, I'm going to give you all kinds of stuff. I'll give you this camel that's behind this curtain where Carol Merrill's standing. And he got donkeys and camels and male and female donkeys. He got, and servants. He got people, human beings, in exchange as the brother. And it was kind of the dowry. It's what they did back then. I hope you didn't have to pay for your wife. It kind of mixes the motives, doesn't it? But anyway. And the amount of dowry that gets paid is actually uh, supposed to show how much this person's worth. And so he really thought she was beautiful. This, this woman, I can't wait to see her in heaven. I'm sure she's gorgeous. But gives him all this stuff and makes this exchange. And then what happens to Pharaoh's household is a plague comes on his household. And we're not told what it is, but we know what he does later. It's impotence. And God is protecting his investment because he made a promise that through Abraham, Abram, that all the nations would be blessed and he would have descendants as numerous as the, sea and the, sh- the, the, the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And that if you could count those, then you could count your descendants. And here's a guy, his name means exalted father and he has no children. So God gave him that promise and that he would give him the land of Canaan and it would be his forever. So he knows these things. And yet we see that he fails in his faith. It's interesting because he's called the father of the faithful, right? And yet he fails in his faith. I think you will find your weakness is not in your weaknesses, it's in your strength. You will fail in your point of strength. I used to be able to lift incredible amounts of weight. I can't do that anymore. And if I try it, you won't see me for a little while because I'll be horizontal. (laughs) We tend to fail in our strengths. The things in which we feel, hey, I got this, Lord. I got this. I don't need your help. Thanks, though. Appreciate it. That's where we fail. And here's Abram failing in his faith. And so all of the plagues that came upon this Pharaoh, they sound very familiar to what happened at the Exodus, right? So we see that it's kind of a predating of what happens with the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston. So Pharaoh commanded all his men concerning him, and he sent him away. But he sent him away with all the stuff, because he just wanted him gone. And he gave him all this stuff and added to Abram's bankroll with people and animals and stuff. And so he says, go. And you might think that that's a good thing, but I mean, do you think Sarai's going to be able to look at him the same ever again? You made me lie, and look what happened. I mean, maybe he says, yeah, but look at all the stuff. We get to keep it. (laughs) Not such a jackpot, because what will a person give in exchange for their soul? I mean, he had to sell out, and he sold out on God, first of all, by being there, and second of all, by lying and thinking that he had to, that God wasn't going to protect him. He had to take measures into his own hands to make sure that God would protect him by lying about his wife. I'm sure you have never been pushed to the point of compromise. I'm sure somebody didn't get in your face and ask you a flat out question that you couldn't give them the answer to. And so you kind of weaseled around the corner with it. Some of us have a greater problem with that than others because we tend to be fear-based or we tend to be pride-based. Rarely are we humble in the right way that we should be. We tend to be on one side or the other. And so either we say, yeah, so I called off yesterday. I wasn't sick. What do you think about that? You know, or we say, no, I, I, I'm still, I think I'm still sick. I, I got a little Carl Vitale throat going on. So I gotta... <laughs> Never make fun of your pastor. Never. It's just wrong. <laughs> All of this that now Abram walks away with is a problem for him, and it's a noose around his neck because when you have stuff, you need a storage bin, right? When you have stuff, you got to store it, or you have to take care of it, or you have to clean it or polish it, you have to insure it, um, You have to take the rust off of it and paint it. Whatever it is that you have, you have to take care of. And it's it's not something that adds to your life. It's something that actually takes your life away if you don't have the right amount of stuff. Uh, The true challenge of possessions is for them not to possess you. And the true challenge of people is not to be controlled by them. Unwittingly, he was controlled by Pharaoh. 
because he couldn't tell them the truth and he didn't trust God. He was more concerned with what other people thought. And some of us fall on that side of the, the, the divide. The true challenge of hardship is learning to endure it because with God, it's not pass or fail, it's pass or do over. Have you noticed that? You know, if, if you pass a test and, and God breeds into you the character that he desires, then it's over. And suddenly it's like, wow, I, I don't struggle with that anymore. Well, praise God, you learned. But then you get to a point where you fall back into the same thing all the time. You go, God, why am I keep falling? And he goes, because you're not learning. I've, I, it's, it's happened to me. So I'm just saying. You see, you can say anything up here and say, I'm just saying takes the edge off. It's wonderful. <laughs> Welcome to Jersey. So this week, we're going to see Lot finally launches. He's now going to separate from Abraham. And God does it in a very incredible way. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're headed, from chapters 12 to 20, it talks about Abraham. And so we're going to see the call of Abraham, which we did in 12, 13. We're going to see Lot launch. We have this battle of nine kings in the following chapter, which we'll talk about next week. And there's something significant about that because it parallels another battle in the book of Revelation. And then we have this character that shows up called Melchizedek. Melchizedek is, actually isn't his name, it's a position. Uh, but we're going to look at Melchizedek and the rescue of Lot and all of his stuff and the Abrahamic covenant in chapter 15. Then we move on to Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the 12 tribes. And you wonder why I have sneakers up on the screen. It's about descendants walking, anyway. It, it made sense to me anyway. If I read through this, I'll give away the whole story. So we'll start from verse one, chapter 13. And Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him to the south. Uh, it's actually the Negev, which is the desert. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. You remember when Abram first made an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. We see that he's always making altars. He's setting up camp and he's trying to touch base with God and get some direction. And if the Lord said, hey, listen, leave your family's household, all your kindred, get out of there and I will lead you to a place. I would want to stop often for directions too. So he's making this altar and he's seeking God's face. And this is why he's a man of faith. The beautiful thing is he went back to where he was in the beginning. You see, he was there where God called him to be, and suddenly there was a famine. He says, well, I'm out of here. I'm going to Egypt, which is a picture of the world. It's a picture of compromise. It's a picture of going someplace where it's much easier, as opposed to God's called me to do something hard and be in this hard place. So I'll go to Egypt, and I'm going to lie about my wife. And it doesn't turn out so great. Now he returns, and the beautiful thing is he returns. He goes back to the place where God spoke to him last. If you ever get lost in your relationship with God, go back to the last thing God told you to do. I'll bet you it's key. You think? He goes back to the altar that he made between Bethel and Ai. If you remember the names of those places, Bethel is the house of God and Ai means heap of ruins. So he was between the house of God and a heap of ruins. I, and I, I said uh, previously, we all kind of live there, don't we? Uh, we live between the house of God, you know, where everything's ideal and a heap of ruins, which uh, could have happened here, but God preserved him and had his hand upon his wife, Sarai. And imagine if Pharaoh had taken her sexually and as a wife, what happens to the promise of the Messiah? So you see, God stepped in. When Abram failed in his leadership, God stepped in. So ladies, you can trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. I'm, I'm speaking to my wife who's home. So you can trust the Lord, baby, not me. In Revelation, 
chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So I find this true. If, if I get off base, if I get away from my relationship with God, if I'm not hearing from him like I should, um, or, or I, I don't have a, a, a real rich relationship with him in his word, I need to go back to where I started. I need to remember what happened. I need to repent and I need to return. And I see it in the book of Revelation with this particular church. And I see it also with Abram. He returns to where God's called him to be, even though it might be a difficult place, there still might be a famine in the land. He's going to go back because he can't stay in Egypt anymore. The Lord made sure of that. So he's finally where he needs to be. So it's remember, repent, and return. Can you remember that? It's got three R's. I try to make things easy. It's about remembering. This is a good thing for your marriage. If your marriage isn't good, remember when things were good. Remember when you looked at each other with a twinkle in your eye and you couldn't keep your hands off each other? Remember those days? Well, repent of what you're doing right now, whatever foul hardship it is, and return to that. Listen, when I, when I dated my wife, I washed. I shaved. I put on nice clothes. I combed my hair. You know, I mean, and, you know, a little bit of breath thing going on. I made sure that I was together. You know, my car was clean. There wasn't stuff rolling around on the floor. That's crazy. If, if some of the luster's gone off your relationship, perhaps you're not putting in the labor that you once did. And so it's good to remember what it is that you did in the beginning. That's why I date my wife every Friday night. Don't call me on Friday. Not Friday night. Because I'm busy. I'm investing in a relationship because I can't afford a divorce. And neither can you. So make an investment. Remember, repent, and return. That's the beautiful thing about Abram. He goes back. He doesn't stay in Egypt. He doesn't go weasel out and find another way. He goes back and he goes right to the altar and he goes right before God. And you can do that right now with whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're struggling with, whatever besetting sin it is that you think has got you down and got you captive, you don't have to be there because through Jesus Christ, we're free. Amen. We just sang about it. Amen. We're truly free in Christ. Verse 5, Lot also went with Abram and flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So, they went away. They came back. He's still dragging Lot with him. He just can't seem to let go. And he, God was very specific a long time ago. And it's funny. God doesn't tell him again and say, hey, let go of this guy. He's going to be trouble for you. God doesn't tell him again. He just orchestrates things so they can't stay together. Aren't you glad for God's sovereignty? I'm glad God protects me from stuff. I mean... There are temptations I'm not sure I'd be able to handle, but I've been preserved from them, like being a billionaire. I am preserved from all the hardship of being a billionaire. You never know who your friends are. People come up and they're nice to you and you don't know why. I mean, forget it. I don't need that to have my face all over the news all the time, people saying things about me. I got enough trouble shooting my mouth off. I don't need the newspapers involved. And so here he is, he goes back to the land, but there's so much stuff that they can't dwell together. It's impossible. You see a theme? Went to Egypt? Nope, sorry, not going to make it there. Okay, go back to the beginning. He goes back to the beginning. And now he can't be there with Lot. And so the Lord is causing them to go apart. Just because you and someone else might have some hardship doesn't necessarily mean that it's the devil doing it. I think I got a few of those. Listen, 
this is not the first church I've belonged to. And I've had disagreements with past churches. And I had to part ways. It was God's ultimate point to get me here. And if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. And it might be the case for you that there was strife, there was difficulty, there was hardship. Maybe you all couldn't live in the same place or you all couldn't remain where you were. You couldn't stay at that job any longer, whatever it was. But God led you on because sometimes if you don't follow his leading, he'll make it hard on you. It's not the way God is because, see, God's a shepherd and he leads us. But when we don't follow his rod and his staff, they comfort us because they rescue us and they get us moving. And so sometimes the rod is for discipline, by the way. The staff is for rescuing. So both of those, David said in Psalm 23, I take comfort in both of them. God rescues me from places where I shouldn't be. And he's also good about cracking me in the backside to get me where I need to be. So what are you worried about? I, I, that's the way I feel about it. He, he mentions this thing that the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. And you go, it just seems like a parenthetical sentence that's jammed in there. I want you to think about the fact that when you and another believer have some kind of an altercation, people watch. There are non-believers that are watching to see how the people of God work their stuff out. And so they'll sit and they'll go, let's, let's see how they work this thing out, these Christians, these Bible thumpers. Let's see how they do, because it doesn't seem like they're doing so great. You got enemies in the land who would just as soon kill them all than have them there, and they're going to sit and watch. They're going to leer. They're going to look through the fence, as it were, to see how they're doing. And I think that's why that parenthetical sentence is there. These guys are having trouble. The herdsmen are arguing and it's a big mess. It's not run right. And there are people watching. I would recommend that all of you get a Christian bumper sticker. A Christian bumper sticker is a real challenge because then you have to obey the law, do the speed limit, you know. No single finger salutes to anyone. You know, you have to, you're, you are on display as a follower of Jesus Christ. If you don't have something on the back of your car, you can kind of get away with being miserable and blending in with everybody else. But if you, got, if you have something definitively Christian on the back of your car, everyone watches. And that's the whole point. You're, you're trying to make an evangelical statement, I hope. So get something on the back of your car. You'd be surprised how God uses it. Anyway, sometimes we see problems, but it's really God's providence. In fact, there's another one from the New Testament. I like to go back to the New Testament when I'm in the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 15, it says this, then after some days, Paul and Barnabas, they, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. That sounds like a great plan. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And you say, here's a couple of good men of God. They've been on a missionary trip together. They're close. But you see, Barnabas has a cousin. His name's Mark or John Mark. In the middle of their missionary journey, he goes, ah, I want to go home. I want to go home to mommy. And he split and he left. And he left them and with all the work that he would otherwise do and help them. He left it with them and he didn't care. And so they got back, saw John Mark. John Mark seems to have recovered from his wah-wah or whatever it was. And Barnabas says, let's, let's bring him when we go back. He goes, no. 
We did that once. He, he, you know, he quit. I'm not going to have him quit on us a second time. And, you know, you can see the argument. You can see Barnabas saying, yeah, but he's my cousin. Come on, you know, cut some slack. Where's your grace, bro? Can't you forgive? What's wrong with you? And you can see Paul saying, I'm not taking a quitter. I'm not going to carry that guy. I won't do it. It costs time. It costs money. It costs, and it's going to be a giant burden on us when he leaves. And I'm just not willing to do it again. So who's right? They both were. In this sharp problem that they had, and they were at loggerheads, they suddenly formed two teams going out instead of one team. And the Lord used that to send out two teams. Well, Barnabas, his name is not Barnabas, but he's called Barnabas because he's the son of encouragement. And so he takes Mark to Simon Peter, another famous quitter. Simon Peter disciples John Mark, and he becomes, he becomes his disciple of Peter. How cool is that? And he gets stronger and stronger, and later on, Paul writes about him, and he says, John Mark, he's okay. He's okay with me. So apparently, God had work for them each to do, and he used this struggle to lead them both. It's not necessarily the devil. You know, the devil. Is the devil, devil does everything. Devil's so busy, my goodness. He's under every chair, he's under the rug, you know, he's everywhere. Sometimes God will cause a holy dissatisfaction for a reason. And it's, it's our privilege to discover what that is. So if you're very unhappy with me today, you could leave. It's okay. <laughs> Verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. It's about time, Abram. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. Now, this is his uncle now. This is Uncle Abram. Abram gives him the choice. The younger man. His nephew, which he's been dragging around all the time. I don't know if it's a guilty conscience because he brought him out here or if he's just gracious. You know, Abram has a reason to be benevolent because God's given him a promise. He's going to give him all the land, right? He's got a promise. God's with him. He can be benevolent because God's with him. We can be benevolent, brothers and sisters, because God is with us. I'm not afraid to helping somebody out, you know, financially or with my time or uh, you can be benevolent because God has given to us, has he not? We are privileged above all people on the face of the planet. We have a relationship with our creator through Jesus Christ who came and died for us and shed his blood for our sin so that our sin doesn't control us anymore. We're not, we're not little puppets of our sin. I'm not addicted to all the stupid things I was addicted to. I don't have to fill my life with all the substitutes for God that I found in this world. And neither do you. Amen. We're truly free. Yeah. Give me an amen on that one. You've got to believe that, right? Yeah. And so he says, let's part. You can go whichever way you want. And he's magnanimous. It's wonderful. Romans 12, 18 encourages us, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all men. Amen. I love the balance of that. It says that you should live with peace with everybody as much as you can. Which means the door's a little open for maybe you can't live peaceably with everyone. And that's understandable, but did you do your best? Right. Did you do your best? The scripture says we should do our best to make peace and preserve the unity of the spirit, especially in the body of Christ. Hugely important. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan. And it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, by the way, that's called Eden. Like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. The land of Egypt is very fertile because it's along the Nile. And it's a very low lying area. And every year the water comes up and it overruns this area. We call it a floodplain where a lot of people like to build. I don't know why. 
the water comes up, floods the land, and so it's very, very rich in minerals and water. And so this whole valley is like the Garden of Eden. And so he looks around and he goes, that's the place for me right there. Man, look at that. Palm trees and, oh, yeah. Get myself a summer home and, you know, get myself a low rider camel. I'm set. It's the American dream, this well-watered land. And by the way, you might not like the taxes in New Jersey, but I'll tell you, it's green. There are a lot of places in the world you go, and it's not green. It's green here. It's so humid. Yeah, well, that's what makes it green. It's good. Be thankful for humid. So he looks out, and he goes, yeah, that's the place where I want to go because I got lots of stuff, and they got to eat, and so let's do this. Beware of the yellow brick road. You got the song in your head now, right? Follow the yellow brick road. Beware of the yellow brick road where you think ultimately you are going to find the thing that you need in this land far, far away in the Emerald City, and you're going to have the thing that you're missing in your life is going to be found in a place. The only place that will be is heaven. And if you substitute anything else in that place, you will be unhappy because you bring yourself with you. It's like people say, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. Beware of the yellow brick road. Beware of the mentality that all I need is... Now, listen, I remember growing up. I remember I was 15. I said, I can't wait to get my license. I just need my license. Once I get my license, I'm out of here. And I got my license, and I realized I got to buy a car. <laughs> and there's insurance and registration, and wow. And I got a job. I got a job, and I know what I'm getting paid. And then you look, and you go, who's FICA? Well, now I need a raise because I thought I was going to make you know, this, but I, I'm making this because I got to give everybody else apparently a piece of it. And it's this never-ending treadmill where you think this thing is going to be it. Oh, if you don't understand, all I need is to get married. That's what I need, and everything will be great. No, that's the yellow brick road. That means you have more challenges. That means you have more of you that needs to die because two people are sharing one place and you can't just leave your stuff around anymore. I'm sharing from my own experience. You can't. You have to think of somebody else now. So suddenly what you think you're getting, you're actually, it's taking something from you. It's the nature of getting more stuff as it takes your life away and human beings. Beware of the yellow brick road. Hey, I got two jobs. This one I can make a lot of money. This one I make a little bit of money. Okay, this is enough, right? Well, then why don't you take the enough one? Well, because I can make so much more doing this. Oh, yeah? How many hours a week will this take? Oh, I didn't ask that question. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Yellow Brick Road is the Emerald City. I get it. I've, I've heard story after story after story of people dreaming of Emerald City and making a decision to get on the Yellow Brick Road and go there, and they get there, and it's not what they wished it was. And they're sorry they took that fork. I know people that have gone into business together that thought this would be great, and it would be in a nightmare. And I could go on and on and on. Beware of the Yellow Brick Road. Beware of shortcuts. God is in the midst of creating character in us, and it's rarely done through our comfort. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Sounds so very un-American, but there it is. And Sodom and Gomorrah ends up getting judged by God, and we're going to see that coming up next. It gets, or a couple chapters actually. So God judges this place because of the sin that's in that city, and it becomes a complete wasteland. In fact, if you go there, the archaeologists have uncovered thick layer of pyroclast, which they find in two places, either around volcanoes or at a uh, nuclear test site, where things under extreme heat very quickly have melted into this black ribbon, and it runs through all of, anyway, I, I, too much archaeology. So then Lot chose for himself the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. 
and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities in the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Now we know Sodom is a really bad place. In fact, there's a behavior that has now taken on its name that is now carried into our society. That's what they were known for. He didn't care. As long as I'm near the green, beware of the yellow brick road. And so he packs up all his stuff and he goes and finally Lot and Abram are separated. God told him to do it a long time ago. It's now caused him some issues and now hopefully everything is going to be fine. And so they pack up all their stuff and away they go like the Beverly Hillbillies. So away he goes into the land of Sodom. And if you remember, the, how many of you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? It wasn't so much better. In fact, they brought themselves with them, didn't they? They turned the Beverly Hills into the back hills. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Notice they were sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from this place where you are northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land in which you see I will give you and your descendants forever. You know how long forever is? Is it dependent upon the Oslo Accord or the UN? Or No. Forever is forever. By the way, Israel was dedicated to these people a long time ago. So that contested little piece of land that's in the news every single day, that's because God has said it is for these, the descendants of Abraham. And everybody's trying to take it away. Anyway, notice God speaks to him. God speaks to him when finally Lot's gone. You don't see God coming and talking to him while he's dragging around Lot. You don't see him when he's dragging around with, with his uh, father. God doesn't come and speak to him. But God comes and speaks to him when he's alone. Guys, it's a good thing to get alone with God, right? Because there are things that will be said to you that won't happen while the radio's on, TV's on, you're chatting and running around like a maniac. Quiet, alone, just you and God, and do business. And if we do things like that, then we won't end up in a situation like King David was, where he was just kind of cruising, taking it easy, slept on his couch till noon, decided to get up. While all his boys are off fighting in the spring of the year, when kings go to battle, David sent Joab and all the people of Israel, and they went to fight. And they had great victories because God was with them. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. But David stayed back at the castle, kicked back, sleeping till noon, goes out, walks on his veranda one day, and there's a beautiful girl bathing. Temptation doesn't come when you're ready for it. It comes when you're not. It often comes when you're in a place where you shouldn't be. When you're in a place where you shouldn't be, you think the devil knows that you're open to temptation? He knows when you're weak. He just has to watch what you do. He can't read your mind, but he can watch what you do. And he'll know when you're weak. And so it happened to David that he's out on the roof and he sees this woman and he's completely lured away and he, it's not the first time he's seen her she's actually part of the family Ahithophel's her grandfather um, we're not in that book right now the funny thing is Lot has walked into a trap unknowingly the green lower land of the Jordan Valley leading up to Sodom was a trap and it's a trap that we're going to see in the next chapter and Abram has to stop his life and go and rescue him because Lot's got himself into trouble. He's exposed himself to a very worldly evil element. And because of that, it messes up his entire life, his marriage, his family, his legacy, his heritage from then on because he's made a bad decision. You can be like Abram and go back to the altar and get altered. And so he's calling on the Lord. The Lord comes to him and speaks to him and says, look, Everywhere that you see, this is all going to be yours. I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to fight for it. I'm going to give it to you. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants 
could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and breadth, length and width, for I give it to you. And then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and he built an altar there to the Lord. He moved, built another altar. Hey guys, wherever it is that you go, make an altar. Sanctify it. You got a problem with your computer? Pray over it and give it to the Lord. Make it an altar. You won't have trouble with it ever again. You, you, got, you got a problem with something? Face it. Deal with it. Get on your knees and make it an altar to the Lord. Consecrate it to God. And this is what he does. So he goes north of Jerusalem now. And so he's now gone from south up into the north area. So a couple of contrasts that I think, I think I see with Abram and Lot. Abram walked by faith. He believed God. And he didn't necessarily look where the greener pasture was and says, hey, Lot, you go over there. I'm, I'm going over here where it's green. You see, Lot had to walk by faith and trust that God was going to lead him to the land and he would take care of his needs. It's interesting how God grows our faith. He allows us to go through things. He doesn't just take away all of our trials and hardship because what do we learn then? Nothing. It's through pushing through those things, like working out with weights. You work out with weights, it, it's, it's going to show. You, you don't work out at all, it tends to jiggle. <laughs> so he's walking by faith, Lot walks by sight. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because Whenever it talks about hearing in the scripture, it talks about hearing the word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Whenever you see eyesight, you have to wonder because it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. The three things that the devil tempts us with. Our eyes become the window of much temptation. But it's our ears actually that God says, you know, he who has an ear, let him hear. Anyway, Abram is generous and magnanimous. And he can be because God's been generous to him. And we see Lot is greedy and worldly. And it ends up biting him in the, in the backside. We see Abram was looking for God's city because he always built tents. He didn't build it like Nahor was known for building a city. We'll see that later. But he always keeps his tent with him and he's always on the move. He made his home in a city of judgment. Lot did. And he, he didn't necessarily care about the, you know, moral fiber of the people that lived there or what his family be, would, would be exposed to. And so he made his home in a place where God was going to bring judgment. And we're going to see that coming up. He becomes the father of all who believe, Abram. Lot, he has this heritage of incest. As he's leaving God's judgment because he's delivered and the angels protect him from that, he drags his wife and his daughters with him. And uh, even the, the daughters who were engaged to two young men, the men wouldn't go with them. They thought Lot was out of his mind. And so he, he hit, you know, he, he puts his feet to the pavement and drags his family with him. You know, his wife turns and becomes a pillar of salt. So he loses his wife. And then he crawls inside of a cave. They say, you know, don't go to this city. And he goes, well, it's a little city. It's named Zorts. Come on, I can go there, right? No, don't go there. But all right, all right, you want to go there, go there. And they give him a concession. And so only Sodom and Gomorrah go down and Zor doesn't. And they had the same problem in Zor. We'll get there. So what he ends up doing is sleeping in a tent or in a cave, which I don't know if you ever slept in a cave. Without an air mattress, that's tough. <laughs> he's in a cave and he's with his daughters. And his daughters say, hey, listen, we're never going to have children. We need dad. And that becomes the Ammonites, and anyway, we'll get there. We'll get. So he becomes this person who's known to produce all of these offspring through incest, and they are the enemies of Israel. And it says you should have nothing to do with these folks because of a choice. Abraham becomes heir to the world, and Lot loses everything in God's judgment, and he ends up living in a cave. We have choices like this every day. We could take the easy road and, and listen to the yellow brick road story, you know, or we could say, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And do what the Lord would have us do. 
Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it feels like you're going into a land full of famine. Sometimes like it feels like you're carrying too much stuff. It's better to be obedient to God and lose some of that stuff. Amen? Amen. And so that's it. Lot finally launches, and he's, and he's got this, uh, this person now no longer part of his life, or at least for a time. Next week, we're going to talk about this the rescue, the Abram comes to rescue Lot and this character Melchizedek and God works in patterns and shadows all the time and is trying to speak to us lessons and uh, pray that the Lord encourage you guys today as you go.